The Holy Gospel for the fifth Sunday in Lent is recorded in John chapter 11, beginning at verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews who had come to Martha and Mary for comfort, in the, to, to comfort them in the loss of their brother, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. At this point, Jesus moves from where he was talking with Martha toward the grave of Lazarus. Jesus wept. And once more deeply moved, Jesus came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the gospel of our Lord. What is more powerful than death? What else is there that has a grip like death and the grave that will not let go, a grip that no amount of human ingenuity can break, the grave that even if it's unmarked and even if it's forgotten completely, doesn't lose any of its power. What is more powerful than death? When death comes, Grief is a human experience that all of us will undergo. To lose someone is always difficult. To lose someone who is still young is especially hard, especially if they're a friend or a spouse or a parent. I suppose that the most profound grief that can be felt on earth is the grief of a parent when a child dies. But together with these, we don't want to forget that special grief also that breaks the friendship and the bond of siblings, of a brother or a sister. Martha of Bethany had lost her brother. And I suppose most of us suspect, we have pretty good reason to believe that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were not all that old, maybe around the age of Jesus himself. Perhaps at least some of them were even younger than Jesus, who by this time had not even reached his 33rd birthday. And as Martha stood there in the receiving line of this long, many day long funeral uh, at Bethany, she was inundated by the wailing of the mourners, which is something that they did in ancient times. And, and also she was uh, almost bombarded by the, 
the greetings and the sympathy and the condolences and the well wishes of, of the many people who came out to see her and her sister, something that we still do today. I suppose that Martha was still in what I think of as the fog of the early days of grief when immediately after you've lost a loved one you still go through the day-to-day -day things that need to get done but later you don't remember doing them you don't know how they got done but they seem to have been accomplished and we can well imagine friend upon friend walking up to Martha and her sister saying my sympathy I, I, I'm so sorry for your loss and my condolences and and many similar things and in, in those days this didn't just happen a few hours before a funeral takes place or or maybe the night before no this happened for the week following the funeral lines of, of, of people were streaming up from Jerusalem over the hill down to Bethany as people heard the news and made the trip to see the family and then on the fourth day of this receiving line Martha heard the news Jesus is coming she went right away. She, she left the area, left her home or, or wherever she was, and, and she went out uh, up the, 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 the sheep path or the little track that led up over the crest of the hill of the Mount of Olives and down toward Jerusalem. And sure enough, there was Jesus the Lord walking up along with his disciples to see her. Martha has changed since the last time we saw her in the Gospels. Martha is not the one to stay behind and get things done. Martha is the one who goes out to listen to Jesus, to see him. She leaves Mary to, to, to stay at home, but she wants to talk with Jesus, and Jesus doesn't waste any of their precious time. Your brother will rise again, he says. And Martha says, yes, I believe this. I, I, I be, she believed in the resurrection that was proclaimed in the Old Testament scriptures. I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And there are actually quite a few Old Testament passages uh, that talk about the resurrection. There is Psalm 116 that Pastor Sutton read a moment ago. There's Job 19, 25 and 26. I know, says Job, I know that my Redeemer lives, and in the end I will see him. Even though my skin is destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see him. I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. And there's Isaiah 29, verse 9, uh, 26, verse 19. The prophet says, Your dead will live, their bodies will rise. You who dwell in the dust, wake up and shout for joy. There's, of course, Ezekiel 37, the, the, the account of the, the vision of the valley of dry bones that came together again and, and came to life, flesh upon bone. And then... Uh, in the earliest part of the, of the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, Abraham professes his faith as God had commanded him to go and make a sacrifice on, on Mount Moriah. And he took his son and a couple of servants and a donkey. And, and Job professes his faith in the resurrection of the dead. But then there's Daniel 12. Daniel 12 verse 2 says, Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. And it's the Daniel passage that gives a lot of people a, 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 a moment to pause because, you know, he says that some will rise to go to heaven, but everyone else will rise on the last day but to everlasting destruction in hell. And that's our problem. Death is the result of sin. And this equation is not very hard to figure out. Those who sin will die. And if that were all of the equation, we know that we're sinners, then that would mean that we would die too. And I suppose we begin to think in this lifetime that death is inevitable, that it's the end of maybe pain suffering a conclusion to a wicked life it's a tragedy for somebody who is young and 
someone might even be led to think, you know, if I don't have proof of hell, I'm not going to believe in it. But that's a little bit like an astronomer saying, if that, that, that I don't believe that there are any other planets or stars to be found because I haven't discovered them yet. But Jesus tells us exactly what's going to happen. Jesus tells Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Heaven and hell are absolutely real places. And Jesus promises a place in heaven to all who believe in him, in Jesus the Savior. Now let's just stay with Martha for a moment as she tries to work through this. She believes in the resurrection. She believes that Jesus is the promised Savior, the Messiah, the Christ. But what is stronger than death? And as she's still working this out, everything changes. Jesus walks up to the tomb and starts barking out commands. Even as Martha is trying to put this together, that, that uh, trying to work it out in her head, and yet Jesus uh, says, take away the stone. And Martha has a, a, a kind of a pitiful objection about the, the, the stench of a body that's been buried for four days. But Jesus tells her what's happening. He says, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? And Jesus prays. And he gives all credit to God the Father for what's about to happen. And then he calls out in a loud voice, Lazare doiro exo. Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus came out. His hands and his feet were, were still bound with the grave clothes and a cloth over his face. But his loved ones rushed up to him and, and, they, and, and at Jesus' command they begin to, to unbind things. And as the grave clothes become unraveled and, and everything falls down and just falls away, uh, all of their misunderstandings become unraveled and all of their doubts fall away. And they're left with nothing but the truth standing there. Lazarus is alive. In John's Gospel, there are, there are, there are just a handful of, 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 of accounts and stories. It's not like the other three Gospels where there are maybe several accounts, narratives of things that happen in Jesus' life and ministry per chapter. No, after, after, a, 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 after chapter 1, where there's quite a bit packed in, John basically gives us one story per chapter, or sometimes a story that takes two or three or even five chapters. There aren't very many of these things. And one thing that John does is he gives us three big miracles that happened in and around Jerusalem. And John's point in choosing to tell us about these that the other gospel writers didn't tell us about is, is because John wants to emphasize the results that these miracles had among the people who were there, some who came to faith and others who did not. And in John 5, we have Jesus healing a man who had been uh, an invalid for 38 years. And Jesus finds him at this pool up on the north end of Jerusalem, a pool called Bethesda, and he heals him. And, and people are amazed, and some come to faith, and others are kind of critical of Jesus for doing the healing, kind of with a how-dare-you attitude. It's a strange reaction to have, unless, of course, they're jealous, which is what they were. And then in John chapter 9, Jesus, another of these Jerusalem miracles, Jesus heals a man who was blind, not recently, but from birth. And he does it right in the temple itself. And, and, and the teachers of the law and the Pharisees and the, and the priests go nuts over this. And they accuse Jesus and they accuse the man who, was, who, who now had his sight and they try to arrest his parents. And, and the result is that they begin to conspire against Jesus for having performed this miracle. And, and, and all along, all this time, there were certainly rumors and, and reports of, of other miracles Jesus performed kind of coming down from up north, down from Galilee, and, 
and from uh, out in, to the northeast in the Decapolis and, and northwest up on the, on the border of Lebanon, the region of Tyre and Sidon. And there were hints that Jesus had maybe raised a girl from the dead uh, and, and, and maybe a boy as well from, from the, the town of Nain. And, but now, at Bethany, Within walking distance of Jerusalem, Jesus raises a man from the dead, and they had all gone to his funeral. This was a popular family, an especially beloved family, and, and Jesus, by raising Lazarus right in front of their eyes, well, what's the result? Many of the Jews who were there became believers in Jesus, but some didn't. For some, this is the last straw. And they actually begin to conspire how to kill Jesus and get rid of the evidence because they begin to conspire to kill Lazarus as well. But here is one single miracle that answered every question people had about Jesus. Is he powerful? Does he have God on his side? Could he be the Messiah? Can he raise the dead? Is he the Son of God? And the answer to all of these things is yes. But they still are asking, who or what is stronger than death? Well, the only answer is Jesus. Jesus our Savior. And by ultimately his own resurrection, Jesus proves and promises our resurrection from the dead as well. But we have to be clear about what we mean by the resurrection of the dead. His disciples sometimes debated and didn't, didn't understand this. They, that happened when they were coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration. And, and today there are theologians who, who debate and, and who get it wrong, who want to allegorize the resurrection into some kind of memorial or, or something. But let's be clear about what the Bible teaches. Old Testament and New. On the last day, the very same body that a person had here on earth and that was parted from the body uh, when the soul left. That body that was laid in the grave, that was destroyed by corruption or decomposition, that body will be made alive again by the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the resurrection of the dead and the crowning work of our salvation that Jesus has accomplished for us. Jesus describes it with these two words, the resurrection and the life. Now the resurrection means that we will rise from death and the grave. But, you know, while we're talking about that, we, we know the stories too. We think about that girl up in Galilee, the daughter of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. She didn't live forever after he rose her body. She died again. And then there was that boy at Nain. Jesus actually walked in on the funeral as they were carrying his bier, the platform he was going to be buried on, out of the city. And, and right there on the same hill, the hill of Moreh, where Elisha had once raised from the dead the son of the, of the, of the Shunammite woman, Jesus raised this boy from the dead to, to tell them this, the Savior has come. And, and now that boy, however, he, he would die again and, and Lazarus would have another funeral one day. But when Jesus is talking about the resurrection, he doesn't mean that we will rise and live a little longer and then die again. No, these, these people in the Bible, the, the youth at Nain, the, the daughter of Jairus, that boy at, at Shunem and, and, and Lazarus, they were raised in the flesh to show us that our resurrection will be in the flesh and that it's a true resurrection from the dead that God is talking about. But Jesus doesn't only say that he is the resurrection because Jesus has power even over the powerful grave, the power that overcomes the power and the permanence of death. And that's the point. Jesus is also the life. The life after we rise from the dead. 
knowing that our sins have been paid for by Jesus on the cross means that we will never again suffer from the things that cause death like temptation and sin and shame and guilt. And we'll be freed from the other things that are the result of sin like, like sorrow and worry and loneliness. You are so dearly beloved by your Savior Jesus Christ that he will raise you personally by name from the grave on the last day to bring you home to be with him forever. What is more powerful than death? It is Jesus who is the resurrection and the life. Amen. And the peace of God that transcends our understanding guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus.